Okay, everyone, um, apologies that I'm going to get the, everything moving a little bit quicker, but I've got a big slice of pizza I want to get eating. Um, I will hand over to everyone because I've got a big group of people next to me, so rather than me introducing, I will just hand over to the bug crowd lot um, and let them introduce themselves. So without further ado, hand over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, I'm really excited because it's many of our first times actually talking at DEF CON. So this is pretty exciting. I'm going to just quickly uh, do a quick intro and then have these guys talk a little bit more about themselves. Uh, my name is Chloe Mistagi. I work at BugCrowd. I'm a security researcher advocate. I'm also one of the founders of Women in Security, WOSEC, and also the founder of Women Hackers. Um, and I'm really happy to be here because we're going to dive into our, these are three of our bug crowd ambassadors that I get to work really closely with and I'm so excited for this panel. Um, I have Jesse all the way down to the right and then in the middle I have Sam and then here I have Daryl. Anyway, I'm going to have Jesse, can you please go first and tell a little bit about who you are and your background. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I think. company, um, so that's my day job, so I spend time making sure our product line is secure. Um, I also run our bug bounty program, and then I spend nights and weekends hacking against other companies on bug bounty programs. Hi, I'm Sam Shirley. Uh, I've been doing bug bounty for about three years. Uh, I started off doing like, full-time research for about a year, and now as a security analyst, or I work three hours for about another year, and then I've been full-time on for a year. Uh, I have been with Book Crowd as an ambassador for about a year, I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've been able to do some really cool stuff with that. Uh, my name is Derek Offset. Uh, I've been on Book Crowd for like two years. Uh, I currently work as a senior penetration tester and uh, been doing that for like seven. Nice. Okay, so tell me, how long have you guys been in InfoSec? Seven years. Oh, about five or six years. Yeah, I think I've definitely crossed the tenure mark at this point. Nice. At this point. Okay, so let's start with you, Daryl. Oh, actually, Sam. Let's keep it with Sam. Okay, so Sam, tell me, when did you start hacking, and what were the moments that led up to that? Yeah, so like probably in my sophomore year of high school, like actually started to mess with like what up, what up stuff. Uh, <laughs> I moved into bug bounty, I think, like my senior year of high school. Uh, I like spoke with some friends on the internet who had been doing it, and they kind of challenged me to do it. But I remember I was working at like uh, Dairy Queen. It's a good time, but I got paid for like a bug, and it was like $500. And at the time, I was like two week paycheck at Dairy Queen, so I was like ecstatic. Uh, so that's when I kind of like decided to like spend a lot more time doing it. And then after high school, I just did it full time uh, instead of going to university. Nice. Jesse, what about you? All right, so yeah, I would say like the first time that I would like consider myself like happy uh, was also in high school. So I bought this watch that I could program. Um, and I programmed it to control all the TVs in high school. Uh, and so I definitely got the attention of that. But that was kind of like my first experience actually trying to break something. Um, and then that kind of led into just being interested in security in general. So I started doing like a lot of research on uh, digital forensics, mobile hacking, that kind of stuff, and then that led into my career starting. And I spent five years working for the Department of Defense doing cybersecurity stuff, and then moved over to private industry after that. All right, Daryl, your turn. So uh, I got started a little later than everyone else here. Uh, I didn't start hacking or doing anything in for a second until I was about 25. So I got into the game a lot later. Um, and and after I figured out that I set up enough VLANs, I went over and uh, started doing uh, InfoSec at Lockheed Martin and then it into the uh, private, se private sector as well. Nice. Okay, so what tools did you start with? Not NMAP and BERT is where I started, and that's it. There's just a Firefox plugin called like, Live HTTP headers, and it lets you kind of intercept them up by a HTTP request. So I think the first call I used to call that, and it was like to uh, 
you should be able to, there's just like really, really an easy thing to learn for websites to use PayPal, you can like pop out a transaction to a penny. It's really fun, but. Yeah, I'd say Burp's for sure was definitely my first Google, right? And I probably spent way too much time trying to figure out why my shit didn't work. And, uh, <laughs> just using my Chrome Dev tools or something, it's way more of a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a good Nice. Okay, so when you start learning, and even today, how do you keep up like with everything? Do you use Twitter? Do you follow certain blogs? Are you one of those people that likes vlogs more on YouTube? What do you tend to use? There's like a lot of there's a lot of really cool stuff, uh, but mostly like Twitter, right? Uh, I follow like probably like 400 or 500 people who are all into a related, uh, and so you like keep up with like. You know, if something happens, if there's any sort of story, then like it gets shared crazily. You know, uh, for instance, like that Zoom bug. Like I'm sure like everybody heard of that. If, if you're on Twitter, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's simple YouTube videos. Like if I want to learn something particular, typically like YouTube. Uh, and then more in depth, you can typically go like you know like hack news or anything like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Twitter is like my go-to. Um, it's kind of how I stay in touch with everybody. But um, another thing that's really important is like the sense of community, right? So going out and like reading other researchers' reports is critical to learning, right? And you use that as a baseline because then you can take that attack and try to do more with it and build upon that and then share back. So I think that's really important how to stay engaged. Yeah, Twitter for sure is, and then I have a. Just a Awful amount of blogs that I have in my RSS feeds that blow up. Um, but uh, like Jesse was saying, I I, I kind of I go and look at blogs that other people do, and then I kind of put myself in the like the mindset of could I have found it like that? Usually, no, it's not. I, I would know, and I try to figure out how they came to the conclusion of trying what they did, and try to like supplement what I actually do uh, to at least add that down here. Nice. Okay, so tell me, since you guys shared a little bit about your like personal experience being a hacker and like the resources that you use, I'm just curious now because I just did a talk on Safe Harbor just a, like a couple hours ago, and I'm just curious, what was the first bug you ever submitted of all time? Uh, the, the first paid submission I, I had was a SQL injection. Uh, that uh, it, and then, uh, 10K is, is that up? Is that what you wanted? Yeah. How, right. how was it? How was it? Was it exciting? Was it like? It was holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> I think like the first paid bug I had was like a SMTP injection on Yahoo, and it was like it was actually kind of interesting. It was basically you can insert uh, character turn line feeds in like an email header and then modify other headers, and like uh, so you could like if the two header was sent before. You could like modify who it's from, and it was really cool because it was all signed and stuff. But it was like a thousand dollars, and again, like freak out exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first program that I hacked against was actually uh, on Starbucks. I thought, I don't like coffee, why not? Um, so <laughs> it's Starbucks. And I had no clue what I was doing, so I just threw in a report like you know, paper shops, and actually got paid like hundred bucks or something. And that's a lot of coffee. So uh, that kind of encouraged me to keep going and, and try harder. And I learned from that, right? Because I, all the questions that they came back and asked me about my report, I could take that and be like, okay, this is how I need to address this in further reports that I submit. So it's a good learning experience. So Jesse, have you ever been scared when submitting any sort of bug of being prosecuted? Yeah, so um, a couple of years ago, I actually presented <laughs> over at Skytalks about a big vulnerability that I found across like 10,000 different websites, from the more government websites, right? So that was super scary um, because I had to find a way to disclose all of that. And it was very nerve wracking because like, most of these companies had no idea how to fix this stuff. They didn't have a vulnerability management program, right? So it was kind of shooting in the dark and like, I hope that a prayer that nothing happened. Um, so that was a little scary, but I, I pulled it off and I'm here today, so that's good. Uh, I think like when I first got in bug bounty, there were like a lot of programs and very particular guidelines, uh, and they didn't mention anything for like legal stuff. And it was just kind of like you can only hack on this and this is this. And like I found this like secret in like a GitHub, and uh, I was like, if I submit this, I think I get like upset. And like I don't know, it was I don't, I, was, I don't think it's fear of prosecution, but like I don't know, it felt very like rigid, I guess. Uh, for me, I think it was uh, another SQL injection that I found that uh, the, the bounty brief was, uh, it, it was 
wasn't very specific about what they could or couldn't do, it, but it did say something to, along the lines of, you have to get the whole, whole database to uh, get paid for it. So I was a little more overzealous than I probably should have been, and looking at it now, uh, they probably should have been really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I have to ask this. How do you guys feel about Safe Harbor? What are What's your opinion on Safe Harbor? Uh, I would have liked to have been on the program that got that could have gotten really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, I think like I think when Bugburn and Sonic first came out, it was very like uh, it's like oh yeah, we're not we're not in a cross Don't worry about it. And it's like <laughs> okay, exactly. yeah. But then I don't know. It, there's not a lot of really cool research in like it's really not legal, and then it's it's really cool to have like an actual guide on for it. Uh, one of my bugs recently, it was really cool because like the program had like very extensive like researcher protection. Uh, it's like the Tesla program, uh, but like they're like, hey, yeah, like you know, we're not gonna prosecute you. Uh, here's the actual legal guideline for it, and then like if you break your Tesla, like we'll help you fix it. That's really cool. But yeah, the direction it's going is like fantastic. I think. Uh, and I think it's really powerful in like going away from like the hey if you connect to your like I don't know neighbor's Wi-Fi you're going to jail right like that whole like rhetoric so I don't know it's crazy. Yeah, I mean I think it's great, and from like a program management perspective too, you know if you have Safe Harbor on there, right? You're going to get more hackers on this program too and hacking, so it's great. Um, but well, like one like motto I try to live by right when I'm hacking, if I ever hit a gray area, I stop and ask myself, okay, are you being an asshole? Like, <laughs> Is maybe like that's when you reach back out to the program and say, hey, like, do you guys want me to keep going with this or whatever? That way they realize like you really do care, you're not just trying to like reach out it um, and interact with them and engage with them. It's critical. I actually think I'll think about that in the future when it comes to submissions. We're like, Am I being an asshole right now? That is fantastic. For those that don't know, has anyone ever heard of Disclose.io? Raise your hand. Okay, we got a couple people. This is great. So those that don't know, Disclose.io, um, you can go to the GitHub page and actually look at all the different companies that practice Safe Harbor. So if you ever want to like try to find vulnerabilities or hack on something, I highly recommend going to that list first and checking it out to see which ones are the much safe ones. Okay, so since we dive into the background now, let's go into bug bounty because bug crowd, first of all, and we're on a bug bounty panel right now. So tell me, you guys, how did you hear about bug bounty, and how long have you been a hunter? I think you guys kind of briefly talked about it, but give us a little bit more details. And Sam, why don't you, since you're holding the microphone? Yeah, so like when I first like got started in like semi security stuff, like I played video games a lot, and like uh, there are people in the community who are like sort of into web stuff. Uh, when I came to like, video game hacking, it's pretty fucking dagger, right? Like it's like people are popping into those forums all the time, and it's like. Might be the exploits and all that stuff, but like uh, one of the guys in the chat was like, "Hey, you know, first one to find like a vulnerability on Pornhub, uh, you get like a you get a rep, you know, like in that community." So like I was like, "All right, let's let's do it." So I went, I found like a cross site scripting vulnerability, and like I don't know, I just got kind of excited because that was the first time I like actually been introduced to like bug bounty itself. But yeah. So I've been uh, probably at it for three to four years now, I'd say, and like bounties in general. But I really got my start when I took a job on the product security team over at Salesforce. I was helping run their bounty program. Uh, so I got to see how that worked like, from a large enterprise perspective. Um, and then that's when I started hacking right myself. So I realized like, how powerful this was and what cool things you could do with it. Uh, I've been on the crowd and Balance for about two years, or I think two years exactly, yesterday or something. I had a pop up from Sandy and say, oh, Congratulations. Okay, uh, but, um, lonely clap there. Lonely right. clap. Yeah, not all at once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think I had any real, really big thing other than my, my, my wife went to night school and I was on board, so I started hacking on it, and that's where I got my start. Nice. Okay, so let's start with you since you got it. You ready? So tell me, how many bug bounties have you been awarded? And that's single bugs. I think it, I think I'm at seventy ish at the moment. I think somewhere around two hundred. I literally have no idea. 
Um, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so ranked in terms of priority and importance, what are the top five tools that you use? And I know number one is always going to be Burp Suite. Yeah, like, it, it depends on the program. Like, honestly, like, uh, there's like the staple tools, right? Like, Clear Search and Subless Search, and then uh, there's some other, like, interesting tools that, like, I think obviously going to be the top five from people, like, uh, and that, uh, and then, like, Burp Extensions, right? Like, uh, I'm definitely going away from like top five and just doing stuff now, but uh, Fran Miner, stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I really, I'm kind of a research, as a researcher, I don't really tend to focus on tools too much. I really like doing like manual deep dives. Uh, and I think that's how I got like most of my books, but like there are definitely situations like uh, where you're know, you need to intruder or whatever. Uh, yeah, those are like my top power <laughs> reading sites or tools. Yeah, so of course, we're going to so uh, I would say, like, aside from that, right, I love working on programs that have a like, really huge scope. So I like doing like subdomain integration using mass for that. Um, Aquatome is a cool tool that goes out and actually just takes a snapshot of each subdomain that you find. So you don't have to go through and manually like, look at the results. So we'll just put it in a nice little report. You can scroll through and see if there's anything valuable, like admin panels or whatever that's been exposed. Um, so I use that, like, Dirt Search. Um, and that's it. But one like general thing with tools, like a lot of people don't want you to like automate things essentially when you're hacking this program. So in a sense you can do it if the program allows, but I, I like to think of tools as it's like if you're lost in the woods, right? And you, your tools are a compass. It's gonna tell you the general direction to walk, but it's not gonna help you navigate all the paths, right? So you're still gonna have to go and do the manual um, analysis of like different vulnerabilities and stuff to try to actually figure out what you're doing. A tool is not gonna be the end all be all of everything. Unfortunately. So basically everything that was just said, but, but, but probably the go-tos that I would add to that are Brett Bach and said that I found some, a ton of things because I didn't rely on the things that, uh, the tools that everyone has on GitHub and all that and just did my own kind of uh, regexes and that's where I found the bulk of my bigger bugs. Okay, Daryl, tell me, what is your favorite bug you've ever done? <laughs> so, probably it was... And it's being recorded, sorry. Just to actually let you know. Well, okay, well, I, I'll Can't be the same one. Okay. So, the, probably the favorite one that I've worked on was, uh, uh, we, uh, we had a, bu a, a bug where we, uh, I found some deep, we found some default credentials and logged it into the site, and then the next day when it came back to it, the license had expired, so we had to go look on uh, Shodan for another <laughs> uh, like server. We stole the license from that one, applied it to the uh, the one that had expired, and, I, and then I found uh, an authenticated SQL injection in it. Well, I think I think my favorite book probably was one I found really recently. Uh, basically, what was happening is uh, there's like a login functionality for a website, and there's also registration, and uh, I think they were using like a very old system for the actual core handling of authentication. Uh, and what, if you sent like, a, for instance, ABC for the username, and it was taken, you'd send it, it'd check it, and pull back, right? Uh, and something interesting about this was if you sent uh, ABC percent zero zero, it thinks the string length is four, and then it goes down thinking the string length is four, but somewhere in translation it gets turned into three. And then the server says, okay, well, we need to send back four bytes for, you know, a memory. So it sends it back. And then you get a random piece of memory, right? So instead of sending ABC, you send thousands and megabytes of null bytes. <laughs> and then the server's like, all right, you know, this is a too long of a username. We've checked if it exists or not, and it's hit that system. We're going to send back the data. And then uh, it just sends back raw server memory. So, you know, like you, you run it for, you write a script, you run it for an hour, and then you're sitting and looking at like 10 gigs of server memory. And you run it through draft, and you're like, okay, let's search uh, RSA private key. And you pull like server secrets. And all right, so let's search my password. Let's see if it's logging uh, passwords. Let me find your password. Uh, so let's write a script to automate like pulling keys uh, using passwords. And it's just a really unique bug. Yeah, so mine's more like a general class of stuff that I've been looking at recently. So a lot of companies are using Slack to communicate within their structure, right? So we can use like that team to pop on Slack and pretty much a gold mine. So I love Recon, so you go out and you look for different Slack tokens and like 
GitHub or GitBucket repository or any you take those, and a lot of times like, they're still active, and it will just give you full access to the report as well. So that's a lot of fun because you know developers throw all kinds of stuff in there and customer data and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you can if you can get into Slack, you can pretty much own the company. Nice. That's very much true. Um, so, okay, how much time do you usually spend a week hunting? Ooh, it depends so much. Sometimes it's like none. Um, <laughs> other times it's like 50 hours. Like, I, I feel like hacking for a lot of people is like, you spend two weeks and you're just dead. It's like, I don't want to do anything. And then all of a sudden, like, you have like this manic week where you're like up from like 3 p.m. to like 3 a.m. and your whole sleep schedule gets off. But probably even that, it's more around like 20 or 30 hours. Average probably at two to three, or as many as many hours that I just go without sleep to supplement that with. So I would say on average, uh, it's probably fifteen to twenty hours a week. But it's kind of like watching, like binge watching TV, right? Like there are some mm -hmm. weeks like just spend like way too much time hacking, and then other weeks I won't touch it. And it's it's kind of a, a good thing to step back and take a break from that because you can really suffer like burnout in some industry. I'm glad that you guys kind of talk a little bit about like how you need to take time off sometimes. Um, I always like to ask this question even though it's never part of this topic in particular, but because we are in the hacker community itself, how do you guys deal with mental health? A lot of times it's just like distancing yourself uh, for a little bit. Like, like we're saying, like, uh, you know, you spend a week like, doing it crazily and then you spend like, another week just out of it. Like being able to like correctly like decide when enough is enough and like, like let's say you're like, I don't know, not really finding anything, not really having a good time, you're kind of forced yourself into a schedule. It's, not, it's good to always like step back and like maybe, you know, like try to spend time with your family and friends and like that. Um, you know, typically like, if I don't have that like, kind of like, you know, like I'm really excited to do this, it's typically hard to find bugs. So like the more I spend time doing that, it's just like the more stressful it gets and the more like, I don't know, feeling kind of exhausting it is, but just knowing when to step back, I guess. Um, yeah, so I, I think taking like disconnected breaks is really good. So like when I get back in Vegas, right, I'm gonna completely disconnect for at least a week and like detox. Um, and then probably go right back at it again. But definitely stepping away is good because if not, you will get burned out really, really quick. Um, and then like through the day too, if I'm hacking on something and I'm just like, I'm not getting anywhere, what do I do? Like, I'll step back from that and I'll go like mow the lawn. And I will solve so many problems while not mowing the lawn and come back and just be able to get right in. So it just stepping back sometimes is really, really good for your mental health. So like for me, I, I see a lot of people on Twitter set like goals for themselves. Like I better find 100 bugs in 10 minutes or whatever they, they choose to say, and then they uh, they update everybody every whenever they do. I, I don't generally set any any kind of goals for that. I find something that's fantastic, it's gonna it's gonna pay for something like my mortgage or whatever. But I don't really set uh, like any kind of goals like for that, especially on realistic ones that a lot of people who are, I mean, they probably get them. They're pretty fantastic. But. Nice, thanks you guys. Um, okay, so since we are in Recon Village, I have to ask, what tools do you tend to use and why are they better or more effective than others when it comes to Recon? I, mean, I think we, we, we did touch a little bit on that already, but um, I, I'm gonna go right back to set off and grab and all just the things that, that uh, anything bash related is, is my favorite. It, it really depends, but yeah, like, as I talked earlier about, like, all those uh, tools, and also just, like, a lot of times, like, uh, building tools for, like, specific things that come up uh, for specific methodologies. For instance, like, uh, I feel like until a couple of years ago, like, doing GitHub, like, for content, like, trying to pull secrets from people wasn't as big as it was. But as that time went on, people have built these, like, really great tools where, like, you can auto-generate the IP keys and, like, pull them, uh, and run through people's repositories with like specific terms. Uh, so typically like it's just like kind of goal oriented tool use uh, for particular programs. But honestly like one thing I think that kind of different is for me and uh, maybe other people is just like picking a particular program and sticking to it and that's kind of their concepts. It's just like learning over time uh, all of the quirks and like the functionality. Like for instance there's a group of researchers who like only hack on Facebook. And then you go to the discussion panel and they're like, yeah, you know, like 
oh, like GraphQL, yada, 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 and like it's very particular, and you can tell they spent like, a lot of time trying to understand it, and they really understand like the ecosystem. So I think that as like a tool, uh, it's kind of interesting, but yeah. Yeah, so the like, GitHub integration tools, S3 bucket integration tools, those are called like my go to. And like if I'm approaching a target, those are going to give me a good idea. Like, is this target pretty hard to or is there possibilities here if I'm further stuff? Um, if I start seeing like S3 buckets open and something like that, or something like that, right? no further problems because the problem number is secure. Um, but yeah, so yeah, just enumeration stuff. I, I love recon, and I think that you can get a lot of stuff out of it if you really focus on it. But I am guilty myself. I, I like to jump across multiple programs. And probably isn't a good thing. You probably make a lot of money if I just set on the focus. Um, but when you have these tools, it's easy to just kind of like spray and pray on different sites so you can see what you can find. Nice. Okay. Uh, for those that don't know, Bacar, we actually just released a. Uh, basically recon video, recon discovery video module. So Buckhart, we have Buckhart University. It was kind of started by Jason Haddix. Who knows Jason Haddix? Cool, he's my mentor. So um, <laughs> he basically created Buckhart University to get back to the community and give them more curriculum in a sense so you can all learn and for other people around the world can learn as well that don't have that access. Um, but yeah, we just posted it yesterday. So there's a recon and discovery video, which is really helpful and very useful. Um, I just want to kind of end with one question for you guys. What do you see the future with Bug Bounty? Ooh, that's interesting. Uh, I feel like Bug Bounty is such a great tool for like uh, discerning people who are passionate about security, right? Like, I think what's interesting about Bug Bounty uh, and like the future for Bug Bounty is just like this hotbed of like research activity. Uh, like in the past couple of years, there's been so much like people who have been introduced and like just really do great at Bug Bounty. And so I feel like Bug Bounty, like as time goes on, it's it's kind of turning into like this like really really cool community of just like people who like find really cool stuff and like work with each other to find bugs. Uh, like the feature of like actual programs and stuff. Like it's been scaling up so crazy like with like 400 companies and stuff. Uh, I just think it's going to get bigger and bigger and it's going to be like a great just kind of like a, a really great tool for like uh, community stuff and like people to, like put time into it. Yeah, so I think more and more companies are going to have a bunch of programs, right? It's kind of the, the trend, right? Everybody's thinking about them and actually trying to be proactive. But I think on top of that, there are going to be companies out there that are going to start thinking about bunch of programs in different ways and try to get creative with their approach. So I see more and more companies maybe leaning towards using it more instead of the like reactive approach, like people finding bugs and stuff that's already out there, but use it like proactively. And before you ever roll a feature out, right, have your hackers come in and test that and give you feedback and, and interact with them. So I think the engagement piece of that is going to shift over the next few years. Yeah, it's going to explode because it has been, and I think it's going to continue. And I, I don't see it stopping. I, I mean, I'm a pen tester, and I think it's a, it's a great supplement for that, for sure. Because like you have so many different people, a sets of eyes looking at it. Instead of you got some one one guy um, looking at it for maybe 30 hours for a given time. Uh, pen test engagement, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a great supplement for, for any, any, basically anyone. Okay, I know I said last question, but now I was just thinking for advice. For those that are new at Bug Bounty, besides, you know, keep pushing, don't give up when they first start, is there anything else that you guys want to add on to that? Don't give up. I gave up once, and uh, then I, I got back into it after a couple months because I, I got bored, and I... I started buying stuff left and right, and, and you know, I wouldn't compare that. I think another good thing is not to compare yourself to uh, the James Kettles or your friends, Rosens of the World. I'm never, never going to be that good. I already I know it, but there's so many things out there that you can still find just based on uh, watching uh, different uh, techniques that have been uh, released to everybody. Uh, I think like sometimes it's really hard to convince yourself, but all the other researchers haven't taken all the bugs. There's still there's still bugs out there, right? When I first started, like I remember like looking at programs, I'm like, oh, you know, there's 20 resolved bugs, like I'm never gonna find anything. And then, like day after day, there's like 20 more resolved issues, 20 more resolved issues. And it's like, wow, like what's what's separating me from that? Like, like how do I do that? And it's just like the dedication, right? Like not giving up. Like I think there's a certain threshold, and like right after you find your first bug, it gets so much easier. It's like 
it's actually a possibility. Like, you know, like you can kind of convince yourself to put a little more time into it. But like, find your first bug. Like, it, it it takes a little bit, but once you do that, if you're really into it, like that's I think that's when you, it happens. And also just the community aspect of it. We were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, find a group of friends to do it with. You know, like uh, if you're in university, like in your hacking club, like I, I guarantee you there's a couple people who are like, yeah, like I want to spend time on hacking websites. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, so I would say like if, if you start out hacking, right, it can be a little daunting. It can be like, what in the world am I doing? I put a brick wall here. Just step back from that and think about what you're trying to attack, right? If it's a, a three tier website, right? Go out and learn how to build that. Go out to AWS and deploy out a server because you're going to see these like things that the companies could have missed, right? These security misconfigurations, like the security groups, and you can go back and check that against your target. So you've got to learn to build the stuff as well to be able to break it successfully. Great. Right. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for taking the time and being on this panel. And I want to say thank you to Recon Village for existing. And also all of you guys, thank you for existing. If there's ever a time in your life you ever feel alone, just know that someone appreciates you. So I've been hearing too many of terrible stories this week on mental health. Just know that you're not alone. We're in this all together as a hacker community. So thank you once again. And if you have any questions for them, we'll probably be right outside that door. And Bug Crowd has a suite that's open in this hotel. The suite number is 3151. Once again, it's 3151, and there's free drinks and a lot of cool new swag, and you can get your stickers there. Thank you so much.